Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ken Tucker. Welcome to this episode of the Marketing Guides for Small Businesses podcast. I'm uh, I'm Ken Tucker, as I said, with Changescape Web, and today I'm joined by Ian, Paul, Jen, and Dan. The topic we're going to be talking about today is another B word, and that's branding. Last week we talked about blogging as a B word. Today we're going to be talking about branding, and we're excited to have a couple of guests today. Uh, we're going to be talking with brand strategists and Root Plus River co-founders, Emily and Justin. And they're also the co-authors of Rooting Up, Essays in Modern Branding. Welcome, guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. So the first thing, uh, you know, I wanted to just kind of get started here is ask you guys if you could just kind of explain your origin story first. And then also, how did you come up with uh, with writing your book? Absolutely. So we first met six years ago. Seven. Um, seven. Seven, <laughs> seven years ago. I was the VP of corporate communication for a human behavioral research company. And um, Justin was was um, had worked with the company in the past through a mentor of his. And so we connected. He was a brand consultant. Obviously, I was in-house. And um at the time, I was really trying to get my arms around that global brand and working to really distill what were a myriad of different ideas and, and product lines and services into this sort of cohesive truth. And I had found through my career to that point, um, particularly once I came out of journalism and, and got into uh, marketing, PR, communications, that business owners really, they poured themselves entrepreneurs they poured themselves into their work they gave everything to it emotionally mentally physically and yet they had this gap between all of that energy and expressing it and to me that felt like an injustice you know they would sit down to to sort of put together marketing copy or even core documents for the company and and they'd fall back on cliches and fall back on really schmaltzy taglines and so I was struggling with that myself. And Justin was was um, really shaking up the world of branding with his ideas around brand. And so we had this meeting of the minds at this conference and those two positions kind of came together and we began doing work together for my company at the time. And um, a little while into that, that um, collaboration, we realized that great brands are spiritual experiences and articulating the spirit, the energy, the passion of a business was a magical ability, first of all, that we shared and that we enhanced in one another. And then also making that um, magic real through the way that you told stories and the way that you formed language so that it could populate through the culture and engage the people inside of the organization, that really that was branding. And we wanted to bring what we now call intrinsic branding, that approach to a larger market. And so Root and River was born from, from that, that idea. Okay, cool. You talk about the magical or the magic, absolutely. But how do you bring the magic home and you know link the correlation between branding, marketing, and lead gen to actually get some business mm -hmm. coming in? That's a great question. Well, we we believe that a, the brands follow the same rules of as in nature. They're agrarian in the and organic in their in the in their structure. Um, it's only in the last 70 years where branding was seen as some sort of external construct that you tried to promote with, you know, PR and advertising. Um, but the reason we call what we do intrinsic branding, Jen, is because it it starts on the inside. And this, so these principles apply to whether or not, whether you're a solo entrepreneur of some sort, or you're the CEO or head of marketing for a big giant company. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't. It's just a matter of scale. And so you can imagine then that there's beneath the surface of a brand is the root system. And the root system, and we know this about nature, you reap what you sow, what you plant, you grow. It's part of the laws of nature. So the, the seeds that are planted in the soil, what we call the soil of the soul, are things like an organization or leader's belief systems, 
those those have a huge impact on the brand because they inform behavior and behavior informs the brand experience, um, whether it's in the, the internal brand or the external brand. Um, a second area that's part of the root system of a brand is around mission, not your mission statement, which usually sucks to be blunt. Um, most mission statements are just evidence that you hired some people to come up with something you don't like. Uh, but the mission is that burning desire inside of you and the rest of the team to make an impact in the world. And then the, the third uh, element of that is related to your standards, which are, which, you know, standards eventually become the culture and then they become also the brand experience, but they start with standards. Standards are like mantras that guide the behavior, the way you treat each other inside of a company and the way you treat customers. And you can see brands, let's say Southwest Airlines, as an example, they have this deep root system. And when and so when they express it in their branding and marketing and then the, in the client customer experience, it's authentic and it's real. And it it doesn't have that shiny fakeness like a lot of brands have because it's born from the soul of the brand that the founder came up with, you know, years and years ago. And when you do this right, by the way. You can, your brand can outlive many CEOs. You can look at Disney as an example or Ford. Um, they've outlived their CEOs in the, and many multiple CEOs, but, but keep, keep that same spirit, that same magic. Yeah. So when it comes to marketing and lead generation, how important is messaging and what role does it play exactly? Um, messaging is huge. Messaging is everything. And this builds off of Jen's question too. Like this is where the magical gets real. So when you're speaking from a place of beliefs from that root system and you're speaking bold truth, branding is, is an act of courage. It breaks through the cacophony of demands for your attention and time and money that are out there because you're not, you're not telling somebody something well you're not repeating again some cliche or some overused statement or like blunt force trauma marketing them with with a phrase that's that they are attuned to ignore because of the overload of information you're telling you're speaking to them from the soul of truth and so that breaks through having a message that's simple unexpected and emotional and is rooted in what you truly believe breaks through and it does two things to be really honest with y'all it attracts and that's what everybody wants right we want people in the funnel we want people to click through to that form but this other thing happens is that it repels and we invite people into this idea that branding is much more about repulsion than it is about attraction at least at the at the level where you're developing it trying to adapt a mindset of okay what is what do i know to be true for for me that I want to put out into the world that I feel confident and driven to do um, that is also going to maybe push away the people who don't believe what I believe as quickly and efficiently as possible so they don't become a drain of my time, resources, and energy. I once, uh, before Root and River, had the privilege of, not really, but the privilege of firing a client. It was a terrible experience. I never want to do it again. Um, but we all know that drain on our people, on ourselves. And so when you do branding, intrinsic branding correctly, you have a salient message that breaks through the noise, that attracts the people who are aligned, who will stay longer, spend more, and refer you more frequently. And you're not wrestling with people who are misaligned, who will drain your, your company. So messaging is everything. We often refer to it as like the tip of the spear. It's sort of the, the, the sharpest edge of the scalpel. And you only have, as we all know, a few seconds to make that impression. And that's why it has to be simple, unexpected, and emotional. I would think too that that's, um, it, it's critical also for, for you know, inside the, of the, the business or the organization. You know, right now, it, it, re, employee retention is a big deal because hiring new employees is really hard. And so, you know, what you're talking about, I, I assume, resonates equally as, as, as effectively inside the organization as outside the organization. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, there, there's a reason, too. Sometimes we get brought in through the HR door, even though we're branding people, um, part, because your culture is your brand. You used to be able to keep that separate. So if you had a, you know, a, a tyrannical boss or, you know, you were, you had a corrupt, you were doing, you know, doing stuff that was terrible, unethical, 
you could still have a shiny brand and no one would really know. Um, the positive side of that is, is that really there's one, we're only, we're focusing on the humans that touch the brand. Um, there, and so there isn't a, we don't really make any split between the internal customer and the external customer. It's one brand, one message, certainly different expressions of that, depending on if you're doing outbound marketing or, you know, you know, digital marketing, whatnot. But if you focus on the, when you, when you focus on your internal audience first, it's your first customer, essentially, what happens then is it, 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 it invokes what we say is that branding is not a department. Branding is a practice. Um, we talk a lot with our clients about raising brand intelligence. And so that it's not about message discipline per se. It's more about the spirit of the brand being expressed in the daily conversations of the employees, the part, strategic partners, vendors, then obviously out to customers in the marketplace. And, and you know it, it's uh, and I had I had one question, but now I'm going to make it a two part question because of that because <laughs> that's because um, you, you said something interesting there that I want to I'm curious about because because um, I agree with you I think uh, you know there's living the truth of of who you are as a brand as we all know sometimes that's easier said than done with some of these folks that you're you're talking to uh, we've all experienced that. Um, so we, we know what's right, I guess. And then it's also though, how do we get them to buy in, you know, like, cause I agree with you. I think they should live their truth. I think they should have a, a certain personality, but how do they, how do you guys get them to, you know, get on board with this extremely important idea that you have? It's everything to their brand. Are yeah. you finding that you have to do a lot of education, convincing, selling, pre, pre-selling before you even get into this to just sort of wrap their head around this? Because I think what something that you just said is, is really important is I, I think sometimes people go, well, this is the, the brand me and then this is the actual me. Like, I don't get that. Like, I personally don't get that at all. Like, I find it exhausting. Like, so I, I was curious about how you guys go about that, that, um, you know, how your process is to help that medicine go down a little bit easier. Yeah. We find that exhausting too. Uh, <laughs> but we practice <laughs> what we preach. And so we are trying to repel the people who are not ready for that idea yet. I mean, they, they can, they can consume, you know, what we, our content that we put out into the world. And that's really the way we don't really sell. Um, anybody who is talking to us in a prospect conversation has already bought into the idea. And this is why intrinsic branding works. It's like, if, if you hear that great brands are spiritual experience and like, uh -uh, no way, not for me. Um, I want to have separation. I want to be divided, have a personal brand that's hidden away and it's totally separate from my, um, brand brand, which I don't get either. Um, <laughs> and we're just like, yeah, no, you don't really come to us. There are lots of other options. And we have a warning label on our website. If you go to rootandriver.com, you'll see the warning label. Um, yeah. We're not for everyone. And your brand is not for everyone. Uh, and we try to inspire and educate and offer. We believe that branding and marketing is really, and we, we take a hard line, like, we're not here to coerce anyone. We're not here to practice blunt force trauma marketing. We're here to share ideas. If it resonates and you feel like this is the practice for you, then then great, let's have that conversation. But most people who are repelled by that idea, they kind of go off. Sometimes they do come back um, and, and they're, they're, they realize after trying other things that that's not working for them, that that has become a drain for them and they want to integrate. But Usually our clients find us at that integrative moment. Yeah. And um, if they if they don't, there's so many other options for them. And you know, yeah. as business owners, maybe that has made our our business, again, it's cultivation, grow a little, we've been growing every year, but grow a little slower, but we're okay with that because of the alignment that we get with our clients and the referrals that come as a part of that buy-in. Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. Because that's, I, I think that's, that's who you should, 
many of us should be working with is the people who have already, they already know that there's a problem. They may not know how to fix it or even what that problem looks like per se, but they know there's something that can't live another day. They got to fix something with, with what mm -hmm. they've got going on. They don't have, they're not sitting there like, tell me why I should do marketing. Like <laughs> that's, you know, right. and so I, I love that. Um, my, uh, my question I was going to ask uh, also though uh, was, uh, and this is a hard one for all of us, I think is, um uh, is that is that dreaded roi um you know the uh, the roi well tell me the roi um how do you answer this kind of question when they're when you're thinking about the roi of a great brand uh where do you even begin with something like that well i guess we begin as we would expect all of our from our clients perspective we refer to our client archetype as a defier which is someone basically that's skeptical of formulas and doing things like everybody else. So we'd have a defiant response to that, which is not that there is an ROI, not that it's not important, but we're measuring the wrong things. Um, it's a silly metaphor, but um, it's like trying to uh, fight obesity by banning large pants. You know, you're working, <laughs> on the, you're working on the wrong end of the problem. And so we look at three areas of a related ROI. One is long-term brand equity. And your brand equity is born of having a deep root system, having a message that's not a slogan that doesn't need to be swapped out every time you change ad agencies, um, but like this true message, this true doctrine that goes out into the world, and then a category to own. If you have those things, you are building long-term brand equity. The more brand equity you have, the less you spend on advertising, the less you can spend on advertising. The example of this is um, GM. Uh, this is numbers from a few years ago. GM spends about $1,200 to acquire a new customer. Uh, Ford spends about $300. That's a direct correlation to strength of brand. Um, so the second one is related to that, which is customer acquisition cost. Um, how much did how much did it cost you to land that cut that that customer and one of the things that emily and i bonded over quickly early in our friendship and then later our business partnership was that marketing was often seen as a as either a um a necessary expense or just the spending of money and the doing of tactics yeah. and if those and i come from a sales background so if those tactics aren't producing you know, leads and whatnot, then what it means you're just having to spend more money, more time, more energy to go out and try to acquire attention, which to pay for attention is stupid uh, most of the time, really. Um, to pay for retention, which goes to the third ROI point. The third ROI point is, and this takes some, uh, some data tracking to do this, right? If you're in a larger organization, which is what did those relationships produce? Where that comes from is we get a lot of clients when they first come to us, we ask them about what are you doing now? What are you doing to market? And they're like, oh, not much, mostly. And they kind of apologize. Oh, it's mostly word of mouth. And we're like, great, build your brand around word of mouth and watch what happens. But to do that, you have to have a great brand. You, mm. you can't have a crappy brand and good word of mouth. Uh, it, that, the, 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 the brand physics don't add up. So those are the three areas that we really emphasize, regardless of the size of the organization. Um, those are the top three um, that we would mm -hmm. emphasize. Cool. Yeah, I think you're, and we always remind ourselves, sometimes we forget about the lifetime value of that person that you're bringing on. I mean, even with the word of mouth kind of person, it's like, exactly. well, you got them in, but you know, how long have they been with you? And Right. Do they, to your point of their behavior, do they refer other people as a result of right. working with you? All that, that's all great stuff to track. Uh, yeah, admittedly, yeah. sometimes I think we forget that just, it's not getting them in the door, but actually, okay, how does that continue to pay off? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Cool, cool. Earlier, you guys mentioned uh, intrinsic branding. I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit more for our listeners, what that is, how it works. Yes, absolutely. So intrinsic branding is branding basically that comes from the inside. It's built upon um, knowing what your message and your belief system are and then sharing that 
in a way that is evocative and consistent in the market. Um, it, it's, it stands in contrast to sort of the standard of the 20th century um, extrinsic branding, right? Like let's create this false reality. Let's create a character, Tony the Tiger. Let's create um, this paragon of goodness like Betty Crocker or this this rugged, you know, outdoorsman like the Marlboro Man. And let's organize around manipulation and let's let's try to figure out, you, you hear this a lot today still, I want to figure out what the audience wants me to be and then be that. And um, we just believe that those are really dangerous, um, false and risky approaches in the 21st century, because when your brand and your culture are out of alignment or based on falseness, that is ground that is going to shift. And in that shift, your brand will be exposed in an extremely negative way. And you, you could be canceled right at that point because it's not based on reality and you cannot, there's really no way to keep that up long term. So intrinsic branding, building upon what is real and true for you, and then going outward with those stories and that message and that those standards consistently gives you this advantage. And again, a long-term ability to grow your brand in a way that will benefit um, you and also the market. So if, if you are sharing something that's deeply held, it, it has this opportunity to improve the world. And that's who we tend to work with, the people who really want to shake up or freshen up their industry or make a big impact um, on the world, whether that's for profit, um, social good or not for profit. You know, we work with all all three. And um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit about the philosophy of intrinsic branding. It's not my dog this week. It was, it was my dog last week. It's not my dog this week. I just want to it's say mine. That. <laughs> that's okay. It was my dog last week. I just didn't want anybody to think it was. They got me last week. I'm just surprised all the other dogs don't start barking at the dog that's barking. Mine, on. mine would if she was in here. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's that's awesome. It, the The thing that really resonates with me, what you were saying there, is uh, authenticity. Right. We we focus a lot these days on telling our clients you need to be authentic. And I think what you're talking about is carrying that into the brand. Your brand has to be authentic. And if it if it doesn't, it creates a dissonance to what you're actually presenting to the world and what you're going to be delivering. And you're, yeah, you're totally. and I would weigh in with that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You're you're burning valuable energy because you're mm. you're trying to deal with a misalignment and it's you know being something that you're really not. And that's, you know, I don't know that many organizations have a whole lot to waste right now. Right. And you can look at it almost in, I mean, brands and businesses are just groups of people with a collective consciousness and a collective psychology. So you can put it in psychological terms, which is uh, authenticity is the fruit or the outcome of being rooted in your core self, your true self. And that's true. That's why it's, that's why we say, a lot of brands are having identity crises right now, especially uh, brands that are older brands led by men. They just are struggling to understand how the modern world is working and it's produced. And so they hear being authentic, but most of them to Emily's point earlier live, most of those business owners or, or, or leaders live kind of a divided life. They have their work self and their home self and they don't go together. Well, that's unsustainable, uh, if, uh, especially if you're going to do intrinsic branding. If you want to do extrinsic branding and spend a bunch of money on, you know, that sort of external image control and all that, fine. It's, that's, it, we're not we're not for you. But if if you want to um, produce, if you want a authentic brand, you there needs to be a willingness to do the work to go inward, and that starts with the founder, CEO, head of marketing. But then the entire organization needs to do some soul checking to say, okay, is who are we? What do we believe in? Why do we exist in the world? And then go from there. That's a, that's a huge, that's a Holy grail. I think to me is, is like, if you can get these, these folks to buy in, I think that makes our job as good as it gets. Like it, it's, it's so you're right. It's so much harder when you're like trying to do this stuff in a bubble of you know the working with one person or working with the marketing department it's it's great and all but like you said when you can get some ambassadors on board throughout the organization that go yeah we are that i i we can we can say that with a straight face 
I think that's as good as it gets in our world. Um, it doesn't happen all the time, uh, uh, but I, I think when it does, there's nothing better. I mean, that was, maybe that's just me. Maybe my colleagues here don't care, but, but I, I just think it's, I just think it's the best. I mean, yeah. it's we like, agree. dang, this is why I do what I do. It was when that happens. So absolutely, yeah. I love how you open yourself up for us to be, to, you know, say something entirely different, Dan. <laughs> I agree with you. Let me agree with you. Today. Did you want me to start? Did you start? Want me to do a repeat of last week? <laughs> I'll get in your face. <laughs> it's ironic, though, and this kind of builds off of what you guys are kind of bantering about. But we, in our practice, you know, you asked earlier how we do it. First of all, we're really collaborative. Um, we do we do have our beliefs, our own beliefs, and our own standards, but we're. The process of branding is a collaborative act and we're not prescriptive consultants that come in and tell you, okay, this is, we did our research, this is what you need to say and this is who you need to be. We come in as archeologists and I do think this mindset is helpful for everyone. Coming in with like curiosity of like, what do we already do? Like, what is the, what is the brand that already exists? And getting really curious about what it is and, and then honing the language. And then we also do this thing where we, we encourage one of our ground rules, we call them elements of trust, is there is no silent dissent in the space of, of creating the brand or un uncovering the brand. And this is where most branding um, initiatives and organizations fail, is that someone sits at the table like this, and ha or like this, but has a different narrative going on in their head that they do not share mm -hmm. until later when they begin to undermine that endeavor. And so we make room for dissent. We think it's great. We encourage it. We welcome it. Um, we get to, we dissent, Justin and I dissent with each other quite a bit. Um, we have different perspectives and that makes for a better result. So I think including all of that in the process of branding is very helpful, holding space for those kind of disagreements and then also for the airing of grievances or the feats of strength, as we like to say, referencing Seinfeld. Like part of doing brand work is it's, it's emotional. And there may be people that say, you know what, that's not true of us. And we've been in sessions where someone says, we can't say that because that's not really true. And you can't brand around aspiration. Not entirely. It could be like 10% aspiration or maybe 20, but it can't be 80% aspirational because now we're back into that manufactured reality zone. Mm -hmm. What do you do? So my question is, what is ethical branding? But but if you want to back out of that a little bit. So what if you have a client that uh, that wants to be seen as, you know, we're, we're ethical, our supply chain, blah, blah, blah. And it is something that they aspire to. How would you tackle that situation? Yeah, thank you. I, ethical branding is a term that I'm, I don't know that necessarily we came up with that idea, but it's been around a while. But as far as something that we think, um, and it really emerged from the the lock, the initial lockdown with the pandemic and everything, and you started to see this very stark separation in the way that brands were communicating. Um, Some were communicating as if nothing was going on. Some of them pivoted quickly to, um, you know remind people of positive things and you know so this this idea though is born of it goes way back it goes back to actually the 1920s to freud's nephew um who was the kind of the godfather of modern advertising and pr um and it was all around propaganda and the manipulation of fear uncertainty and doubt um, and, you know, basically creating demand and, and an impression around that wasn't true in order to support a business model. So examples of that would be like breakfast is the most important meal of the day. That was a PR campaign that he ran. Uh, diamonds are forever. Uh, the use of roses uh, as a sign of romantic love. All of that was manufactured. So when it comes to ethical branding, there's a very clear line. There's, there's, and it's this kind of inspired by Oprah when she's one of her rules for living is don't add more darkness to the world. So there is a dark side to branding and marketing. And that uh -huh. is the manipulation of fear and certainty and doubt, the manipulation of biases, the coercion to use comparison, um, insecurities and whatnot to um, promote your brand. And then there's the light side because branding is just a tool. 
it, you, you know, it's, it depends on the ethics of the human that is using the branding tool. And the light side of branding is inspiration, invitation, storytelling. Um, it, and so you look at like a brand that's generally almost always on the light side would be a brand like Nike. Um, certainly they, they made their mistakes from an ethical standpoint, but they were, you know, they seem to have addressed them and now, and, but they've been behind social causes from the very beginning. They're, they didn't suddenly just decide, well, this is good for the business. We're going to, we're going to do it. They've been behind social causes from the very beginning. Salesforce is another one like that. You see more on the unethical side is more related to a type of desperation in the marketplace because there's no differentiation. It's usually pretty harmless. It's usually done in the form of humor. I think of Liberty Mutual, and I can't believe somebody paid money at that company for those ads. Um, <laughs> they're, not, they're not necessarily adding to the darkness of the world, but they are adding to the stupidity of the world. And if you're going to spend money to do marketing, add light, add hope, add inspiration, because the payoff is so much better than doing the opposite. Hmm. Yeah. What if their human side, not, and this is not to challenge that whatsoever. Uh, it's, it's really truly a question. I, what if their, their authentic side isn't on the light as much as you, as, as it's, as it appears to be. And, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but yeah. I'm sure you guys have worked with some of these, you know, where it's just, who they are may not be in that aspirational place. What are you? What do you do with that? I'm sorry, I'm taking someone's question. I know. <laughs> I don't mean to hog questions. I, you know, I, I think when we say light, it doesn't mean you know roses and flower like rainbows and unicorns and everything's great. I think it means whole and and um, complicated and and dichotomous because that is the human condition. I think it's more about reflecting what's real. And I mean, I we do work with people who have those complexities, but that's really what makes people interested and interesting. And it's always reflected in the brand in some way. So yeah, there can be difficult, difficult moments kind of looking at that, you know, maybe how our shadow side is playing out in the brand, um, but it's real. And it, it kind of goes back to that conversation around authenticity and being genuine. And as human beings, we're really good at sniffing out insincerity and mm -hmm. it, it does repel us. And so again, it's not just about, you know, being positive and hopeful. It's, and I think Nike has done a good job of this. You know, there's, they are reflecting a struggle and there are other brands that, that do this well too. And um, they are reflecting, in the best of cases, their own internal struggles. That's really uh, the height of the of branding, in my mind, uh, ethical branding, yep. is saying, hey, we're not perfect. We're struggling with this. Here's the steps we're taking. And we're going to continue to listen and grow with you. And I think so many people mismanage crisis, um, you know, crisis communications and crisis marketing by not doing that when the answer to me is always so simple is to to say we hear you and we're gonna we did the best we could and we're gonna do better a great example of this is lin-manuel miranda um, when hamilton was put out on disney plus um it was in the height it was just around the time of um the civil like the unrest that was going on in the wake of george floyd's murder and he took a lot of heat uh, for the portrayal of the different characters and um, not necessarily dealing with slavery in the in the production. And he listened for a few days and then he just said, fair, fair game. I'm an artist, the criticism is welcome. I did the best I could. I spent seven years or whatever it was writing this and it, it is a reflection of flawed people, but thank you for the criticism and uh, Kind of moved on and it just died it just died because that was just it was real it was human and uh i think that's a wonderful example of, of the light yeah it's easier well, to do when you're already genu uh, genuine though <laughs> if you're not genuine then it's harder to pull off yeah. yeah well you see it too with i mean social pressure and market pressure are the same thing now and um after the january 6th insurrection and then um, after the, 
you know, when the election integrity was called into, into question and all of that, the number, and then what happened in Georgia, the number of brands that would have never said anything, said something. And that's, that's another part of this. This, this isn't about being what we call woke washed, which is sort of pretending to be all enlightened when you're not, you're just, it's just a good marketplace as a, as opposed to like being willing to take a stand. Um, one of our mantras is it's always good to, it's always good for your brand to take a stand. Um, and that's an extension of both ethics and sincerity and being genuine and all that. It all relates to kind of this continual pattern of behavior, but sometimes history approaches you and to reject history, to ignore history, because you're worried you might offend somebody is a sign of weakness. And so brands like Home Depot and Coca-Cola and NASCAR and, uh, you know, these brands, like I saw some the other day, and I don't mean this as a political statement at all, but it said that it said, who knew that uh, Republicans would be against uh, Coca-Cola and baseball, <laughs> you know, like as an example of just how wildly different the world is. And these are influenced by brands. These are brands making these changes. I think what we, that's to me, that's a type of ethic, not so much what you believe, but that you're willing to stand up for what you believe in. Well, we talked a lot about branding, how important it is, what it does. But what if you have someone that hasn't really put any time and effort into creating a brand yet? Where would they start? Great question. So I think they start by setting aside time and space to dig into that soil of soul that we mentioned earlier. And, and again, I, I always recommend taking that observer's point of view. Um, so that's one, you take an observer's point of view on yourself and try to get real with what are my deep beliefs? Like what is powering me to take these steps, to take this risk, to become an entrepreneur, to start sharing my brand with the world? Um, the second thing that you need to do is to suspend your disbelief. <laughs> In other words, we all sort of have this hardwired, I don't I think it's societally influenced and also evolutionarily influenced our impulse to say, well, I'm not special. Like it's just me. I'm not, nothing really makes me that different. You're going to have to set aside that belief to allow yourself room to really dig into what does make you unique. And we, we something makes you unique. A lot of things make you unique, but we have to get rid of that idea that we're not special. And then finally, it's about a process of refinement and integration. So once you do have a few, and we work with our clients to help them define five core beliefs, and then from those we build standards. So if you can get to three or five core beliefs, um, those that's wonderful. And you can define those, we, we kind of narrow them down to one word, you can define those in your own way. They don't have to necessarily take on a traditional meaning, but maybe starting with like attaching stories of how you lived out that belief is a really good uh, place to begin. And maybe there are stories about how that belief has informed the creation of this business or the desire to develop your brand. So it's making this connection, it's crossing this bridge from the separated selves that we, we tend to kind of fall into, the dividedness that we fall into as human beings. It's, it's weaving through like, no, I believe in beauty and that's why I want my brand to be really artful. Um, and so now you can take that idea and say, okay, well, if it needs to be artful, do I wanna partner with a, an artist to, to help me draw some custom Instagram tiles? that are gonna be colors that I think are beautiful. And so now we have this through line um, based off just some simple time set aside to begin self-inquiry. That's awesome. And it, it kind of leads into um, one thing I've been thinking as you guys have been talking is um, it, it's it's very organic. It's very natural. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the, the phrases you're using, um, which is awesome to hear. It's actually, you know, oftentimes marketing can um, people use very uh, lots of acronyms, lots of scientific jargon, um, which has its place, of course. Um, but um, one of the terms that I've heard you guys say is humanistic marketing. And what does that mean? And and maybe you can uh, talk to our listeners a little bit about what that means and, and how that applies to their business. 
Yeah, we love that. I, we love that term um, uh, because it speaks to the behavior. So you can look at ethical branding speaks to the intention. Humanistic marketing speaks to the behavior, the activities. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's the marketing version of the golden rule, which is do not market unto others the way you would not like to be marketed to. Um, and it, it is, it's a gut check, though, because of the pressure of if you're a CRO or you're a CMO or you're on, you know, that pressure to produce results, um, it's, it's easy to make the human an abstract. And when you make the human an abstract, this is why we, we, we ban the term target audience from our lexicon because nobody wants to be a target. Also, demographic data is mostly useless uh, when it comes to branding and marketing. Um, as far as bigger strategies, it's great for like targeted strategies, but somewhat useless from an overarching strategy. And so humanistic marketing is remembering that we're talking to people and that, that communicating with a sense of consistency, simplicity, sincerity, um, being artful in your intention. Don't use stock photography. Don't use, you know, don't, don't use, as Emily used the term earlier, blunt force trauma marketing, where you're basically beating them into submission through, you know, click funnels and email chains and all that stuff. Not that those are necessarily bad. It's just that in inhumane marketing is abusive to the relationship with the marketplace, with the audience. Um, another one is don't gaslight people. Uh, humanistic marketing is honoring the humanity of the people you're marketing to. So don't manipulate them into buying something they don't need. Um, and you can still sell. I mean, you can still preach. You can still pitch even. But when you remember that you're, it's a human you're talking to and, you, and that, that there's a tendency with market in marketing to gaslight the audience because, into creating a false reality. It's, it's, a, it's far more common, I think, people re, the, than people realize. And... Again, I go back to this is sort of the uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's an element of this that is a that ha- the marketing leaders feel that pressure. And a lot of this is subconscious. They, they're not necessarily thinking, all right, here's a group of people we're going to go manipulate. It's pause and think about the human. And then the final thought here on this is if you don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. When you read your marketing copy, you look at your ad, your video, your ad, whatever, and you look at that and your own BS detector goes off, then you know it's going to go off in, your, in the marketplace. You're, you're sort of the first uh, uh, receiver of that and how you feel about it, whether you're enthused about it or meh about it, is pretty much what the market's going to respond to as well. I love it. And and just to uh, something that you said there really resonates with me again. And that's just um, when you manipulate um, prospects and they become clients, you reap what you sow, right? They're, they're not going to be your best uh, clients or customers um, because you they know like when, once they get in there, they know they're not a perfect fit. Um, and some people feel quite jaded after that. So it, it always makes sense to be um, you know, to to represent yourself uh, truthfully. I think that's my approach, anyways. <laughs> that's because you're Canadian. <laughs> I might have something to do with it, but I don't think that's. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's funny how Americans we like to be like. Oh, are you Canadian? That we're like. Oh, that'd be great. But you to ask a Canadian if they're American, that's super offensive because <laughs> you go the other way. <laughs> we have family on both sides. It's okay. We understand each other. <laughs> you guys have, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you have a community called uh, Being Marketers, and uh, I thought maybe you'd uh, like to tell folks a little bit uh, about that. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, we love our community. It's a source of joy for me. Um, Being Marketers is a place where you can come to practice and be inspired by others who are practicing ethical and soulful branding at the same time. So um, in the community, we have weekly brand bears, which are these small and spicy, I call them little things that you can do to build your brand every week. Um, We have community members that are CMOs. We have community members that lead large brands. We have community members that are solopreneurs, founders, um, people just starting out. 
but they're all coalescing around this idea of branding and marketing from a ethical and soulful place. Um, so we have weekly um, live kind of office hours in the community and just the conversations have been really rich. We, we actually just launched at the beginning of April. And, and since then we've just seen people sharing strategies, sharing inspiration. And it, you, you know, we really created it because marketing can be so overwhelming and really lonely, particularly in the last year and a half, right? I mean, we've all sort of been in our heads of what do we need to do? How do we need to evolve to this new marketplace? And it's mostly up here. And we fall into that ourselves. So to be able to have a place where you can come be a human being first, and then an and then a intentional marketer second is really the idea behind the community. So we welcome everybody to, to check that out and, and come in and see what it's all about. Cool. Awesome. You talk about um, modern day branding that requires a balance and recognizes the collective power of duality. So what do you mean by that? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, this this goes to this idea to, and Emily already touched on this, is that humans are, we're dichotomous creatures. Um, and this is why we say great brands are spiritual experiences, is that to put it in very sim sim simple terms, we're sort of half animal, half spiritual. Um, we're the only creatures that can witness their own evolution. Uh, we're the only creatures that seem to under, have uh, various levels of consciousness. Um, we're the only creatures that have some level of f free choice. Not, you know, there's certainly animalistic parts of ourselves that are unconscious, but we're just, we're, there's, there's something different there. And what has happened is really over the last, if you look at it from a historical perspective, over the last 1500 years, we've that all of society, especially in Western cultures, have been encouraged to sort of be separate, to be split, to hide parts of yourself. And um, you think, well, what in the world does that have to do with branding? Well, the illusion begins with the separation. That's when this, that's when the tendency to is, all right, I, I see myself as this type of person I, this is an image that I put on because I want to look a certain way. And then, then you start to get a little bit of success and then you can hire somebody to go market that image to the world, but it was never real to begin with. Hmm. So um, the, bringing understanding that we're dichotomous and that, that humans are messy and we make mistakes and part of the joy is the mess the part of it the, the this part of what makes sincere, sincerity and authenticity work is showing a bit of the mess showing the um showing the 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 things that didn't work um showing the you know admitting to the mistakes that have been made and then i think there's another element to this too which is um you, you have to, you really do have to match your brand and your language in particular to the level of consciousness of your audience and by level of consciousness, I don't mean necessarily like a woo-woo term for it. I mean like Maslow's hierarchy cool. is that if your brand is trying to um, reach and serve people that are maybe in the upper end of Maslow's hierarchy around like self-actualization or a higher level of consciousness, um, it's an entirely different approach to the marketplace than people that are maybe in more survival mode or acceptance mode. Um, and it's yeah. it's it's taking into uh, the, into like into the equation that we're all the same in many ways as humans, but we're all also very different. And wherever you can bring a sense of connection and intimacy to your brand, you benefit. Everyone benefits when you do that. Yeah, that's uh, that that's awesome. I mean, we were talking. I don't know, three or four episodes ago about the elements of value period pyramid that uh, was in the uh, Harvard Business Review a few years ago, uh, you know, which really kind of maps back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so um, yeah, that's a great point. Guys, thanks so much. Um, you know, we're uh, coming up on our time limit, but I've really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I've got on the screen here the best ways that uh, folks could get a hold of you guys, but I want to give you guys the last word. You know, is there anything else you want to leave our audience with, or uh, do you, you know what what are the preferred ways that you prefer to hear from people and start to engage? Thank you for for sharing those. We, you know, we invite people to visit the website, and there's a page about being marketers. If you're interested in the community, you can get our book on Amazon. Again, it's called Rooting Up: Essays on Modern Branding, and that's a great place to start too. If if you want to 
no more. Also on our blog, which is called Musings, um, there's we just have a ton of free content there. So so please take advantage of everything that is available to you as a resource. And and I just would say that um, I appreciated all your questions and the conversations so much. And um, just that that. Uh, just to try to maybe look at your life a little bit and look at your work and see any divisions that are that are in there. Um, we're certainly not perfect. We all have those divisions and not see it as a diagnosis of something bad, but as something that is interesting. It's a little bit of the wabi-sabi, you know, that, that the broken parts are the, the interesting parts of the brand and maybe um, look at how you can share a little bit of those if you're ready to kind of do a brand dare for yourself. How can you share something that's maybe in in the crack? Um, that that would be my little challenge for your audience. Cool. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Um, Thank you. We'll we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Great questions. Great interaction. Uh, I, I am very. I love your format. It was fun. So thank you for having us on. Thank you. Absolutely. All right.